Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning study, the last study morning study for the week, dealing with um, uh, Daniel's last vision. But before we begin the study, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time once again that we can open your word together. And we invite your spirit's presence here. We need you every moment of every day. And um, we especially need you in the time that we live in and the times that exist in this movement presently as we are trying to understand your leading and guidance. And so we just pray that as we open your word, that your Holy Spirit can come into our hearts and minds and that we can be united with you and with one another. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. Now, we are studying Daniel's last vision. But we need to, um, because of the, the last few studies, we spent some time uh, this week looking at Jeff's study on Daniel chapter 2. And we, we've, we had problems with it because it seemed to depart from what we already understood, uh, what Adventists have understood and what this movement has understood about Daniel chapter 2. It introduced ideas that that I'm familiar with and the direction that those ideas go. They come from preterism. And then yesterday we were a bit blindsided by the article that Jeff wrote called Future for America in July 18, 2020, number four. And we went through that article. And uh, in that article, one of the, the highlights, basically, if you want to call it that, is uh, the rejection of all the light that's come to this movement since 2012. And that, that basically Habakkuk's two tables, at that point, there was, according to Jeff, the beast from the bottomless pit, um, slaying Moses and Elijah, and leaving them on the streets. Um, and then after three and a half days, uh, they're resurrected. And so uh, there are people in this movement who are, and one you can see on the July 18, 2020 study group, uh, Pat Rampey has posted Jeff's article, and I've made some comments on it, and and Pat says, um, I, I said, the article is a rejection of all this movement studied since 2012. Pat Rampey says, yes, it is, but I agree with Jeff. And, and I'm not making an attack on Pat Rampey as a person or anything. I'm just saying that this is kind of understandable that many people are going to just go back to Jeff. So I give some explanations. So I'm just going to read this here. And it says, I do not see how you can. First, Jeff parallels Miller, if we accept Jeff's argument. Yet Miller does not follow or lead in years of teaching error, and then repent of that error, unless you call October 22, 1844 error. His articles are full of self-contradictions and a logic. If we believe that we are repeating Millerite history, where's the parallel in Millerite history? The reason Jeff retired was for the very reason that he knew if he was to fulfill a role, it would be that of Miller after 1844. This he is now doing. We love Jeff, but I cannot accept his logic as it contradicts the foundation that was laid in 2012 in Habakkuk's Two Tables. Jeff would have to reject Ezra 7-9, for instance, and everything that comes out of it. The light of the midnight cry shines all along the path. Jeff is asking us to reject the light of the midnight cry in Millerite history. This is not something I am prepared to do. And then the Pat says, suit yourself. So not really a very good way to comment on what I said, because uh, that's not how we dis determine what is truth. So it doesn't pre present an argument. So I said, it is not a matter of suiting oneself. It is a matter of understanding what is truth. 
How can you argue that Jeff is Miller, and then after July 18, 2020, not accept the light that comes from the disappointment? Jeff cannot revive FFA any more than Miller could have revived Millerism. I wish the facts were different. So, so we had some time to think about it. Yesterday, we, we read the article. Uh, I mean, I know Dwight had read it the night before, but I had just uh, looked at it just before the study yesterday. But uh, I felt there was things in there that we needed to address and understand. Now, um, any comments on, on Jeff's article, people who've read it on their own or uh, thoughts on right. thing. One, one comment that I present for all the, the consideration of all that are in this study and all that may view this later. Mm -hmm. If we are to read the first sentence of Jeff's last letter. Yeah. So that's the one that says the message of Daniel chapters eight and nine, which are represented by the Uli River, were unsealed in 1798. Okay. Am I alone in having a problem with the structure and the subject of this one sentence? Okay. So, so first it says, <laughs> uh, uh, Daniel's chapter eight and nine, which are represented by the Uli River. Um, so I think it means uh, presented. Uh, now I'm not sure what. Now he's referring to his his articles in the Time of the End magazine. Well, <clears throat> but when we look at uh, so when you go to Daniel chapter eight, definitely um, that's going to be by the Uli River. Agreed. Um, <clears throat> Daniel chapter nine, we're not given any indication where this vision occurred. Correct. Right. Now, when did ja when when do we see that Daniel chapter eight is occurring? Well, that's going to be uh, in the time of Babylon. It is in the third third year of the reign of Belshazzar, right? Right. Yeah. And when is chapter nine said to occur? Well, that's in. Uh, the first year of Darius. So that's in, um, it's probably in 538. So in the spring of 538. So the point, the point being is here is Belshazzar in chapter eight. Mm -hmm. Is, is he a, a party that is yet seen to become righteous. Is Belshazzar going to become yes. righteous? Yes. No. Okay. Now, when we come, when we, when we segue from chapter nine to chapter 10. Yeah. Here again, we are in the third year of a king. We are in the third year of Cyrus. Yeah, technically it's the first year of Cyrus, but the third year since Babylon fell. Okay. Yet yeah, Cyrus is shown and has been accepted in studies as being a type of Christ. Yeah. So is Cyrus seen as being righteous? Yes. And this vision is occurring where? Well, this is the Hittical. Correct. Now, the heartburn that I was having over the presentation, beginning with this first sentence, mm -hmm. the message of Daniel chapters 8 and 9, which are represented by the Uli, we cannot state that Daniel 9 is by the Uli. No, because no, it's, it's probably not. Um, so... We are we are in a situation where this 
presentation, this, this beginning of this particular study is based upon a premise that is not correct. Well, you know, there's lots of premises that aren't correct in these studies. There's lots I'm, of things that are con self-contradictory. My, my heartache with this is dealing with this first sentence. Yeah. It's kind of the, the flag that alerted me that this document needs to be handled extremely carefully and needs to be examined much more critically, deeply, than many that have gone in the past. Yeah. We all trust yeah. and believe that our Heavenly Father has been leading Elder Jeff. Mm -hmm. But this particular epistle has so many points of error, so many points to question, that I'm having a hard time with it. Yeah. So, so one of the things you know that, that we know that has happened in this movement, there have been times when people have come. Uh, we saw this with um, um, Mark Bruce. We saw this well even before that with the other groups that left in 2014. Uh, we saw this. Obviously, with Parminder, there was this idea, Jeff's time is up. And, you know, he's fulfilled his role as Miller. And now we're going to be we're going to be the ones giving the message. Right. So we've seen this. Right. And and these. These assertions definitely, definitely were preemptive. I mean, they, they, they shouldn't have occurred. There, there was no reason to say that Jeff had finished his work. You know, Parminder tried to say that Jeff was dead, so we don't listen to him. And the vast majority of the movement went and followed um, on that. And we, we, we paralleled November 9th, 2019 then with April 19th, uh, 1844. And then, and then we had this message, and and in that message, you know, Jeff now becomes more a participant rather than a leader in the sense that it's not the message that he was given. This is the message uh, of the second angel's message, right? This is the message after April 19th, 1844. But Jeff is definitely still, you know, the leader of the movement, but he's not the originator of that message. The message of July 18. And, and so we can parallel that message with the message that happened in Millerite history from April 19th to October 22, 1844. And then we parallel that um, disappointment with November 22nd, 1844. So July 18 uh, becomes that disappointment. And Jeff steps out of the way. And the reason he does so is because he recognizes that he's a parallel to Miller. And um, and he doesn't want to repeat the same mistakes as Miller. But, but of course, you can't not fulfill your role. So the role of Miller after 1844 is eventually to repudiate October 22nd, 1844. That it's, it's not something that he participated in. He accepted it, but really this was... A mistake. And Jeff is doing the same thing at this point, correct? Agreed. He's acting as Miller, right? So for for us who know the past, um, sure, we can recognize that people in the past, they were trying to, this was fanaticism that was trying to reject, you know, what Jeff was doing. Um but there does come a point when Jeff takes the role of Miller after October 22. And so he's done it, right? He's fulfilled that role. And we know that history, so we shouldn't be drawn into that. We're not going to become First Day Adventists.
because that's the parallel, right? So, um, but going back to to this um, sentence here, it it shows that there is a and 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 so we have this sentence. Now, if we look at this paragraph, because you have to take the whole paragraph, so he's just arguing. We could say that chapter eight was interpreted in Daniel chapter nine, but of course, there's nothing in Daniel chapter nine that says it's a vision by the banks of the Uli. Okay. Um, and, and what he wants to draw us to is to this 70 years. But we also know that this understanding that we have, that we've had since 2012, has been an expansion of an understanding of the 2520. So he wants to go back to the 2520, right? You know, that was light. But all of those things that happened since 2012 aren't light. And, and of course, that would include Ezra 7-9. That would include all of the light that came in regard to uh, the, the last the seven kings of Judah, the first seven kings of Persia, everything about Trump. Um, all of this will, by Jeff, would have to be rejected, right? Yet the foundation that was laid in Habakkuk's two tables was simply built upon as the logical progression of understanding how God was leading this movement. There's nothing in Millerite history for us to, to parallel to, to say that, you know, at some point in Millerite history, um, the whole movement went off course and then Miller had to bring it back on after there was all kinds of false time setting and false ideas. We just don't have any example of that. So the whole, the whole argument made in the article is really inconsistent with, with what this movement has taught in Habakkuk's two tables. It's, it's contradictory, self-contradictory. So, so, I mean, that's, that's where, where I sit. I mean, it, it just, if we look at Millerite history as the model, we have to continue on. Right? We can't go back. There's just no way of going back with what the movement has done. And so. Now, <clears throat> there's one thing that I would like us to be very cognizant about. As mm -hmm. we've been addressing that this would look to try to erase the light that has been being given since 2012, mm -hmm. or at least 2013. Well, I, it would, would include the light in 2000. It would have to include the rejection of Ezra 7-9, because Ezra 7-9, I mean... He, he, once you put that into place, everything else just follows. So right. he would have to reject that. If, if we look, I mean, when we open these articles, there becomes a dialogue box to the right of the screen that says categories. Okay. And under categories, there is given a a breakdown of different articles that have been being posted herein. Yeah. I found it interesting. I did, I did a very fast um, look over of several of these categories. One of them, the prophetic keys yeah. are primarily articles that were written in 2014. Right. So if we're being recommended with this article entitled Future for America and July 18th, 2020, number four, to reject the light that has come since 2012, then why take the time to post articles from 2014? 
Yeah. And then, um, I mean, if we look at those articles, I mean, I, I don't know what's particularly in them. Now, this one's pretty short. Um, so, I don't know. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Let me see. The Alpha and the Omega. So, these are just look to be uh, short points. Um, and they might not bring any new light that happened after 2012. That's what I'm saying is they might just simply be articles that he wrote going back to what, what he understood. I don't know. But um, I, I just find it, I, I don't see how we could say, okay, we have Habakkuk's two tables. We're going to go back there to Habakkuk's two tables. And we say, well, where do we go now? What do we do? Do we just sit there and, and sit on that truth and say that there is that all of that light that we had? How do we even get that out of our thinking? You know, how we understand the lines, how we understand Millerite history. Um, you know, the first day of the first month, the fifth day of the fourth month, the first day of the fifth month, the tenth day of the seventh month. That would have to be rejected. Right? Unless a person could say, well, there were some things after 2012 that were correct, um, but they were mixed with a bunch of error. Well, how does somebody then unravel that? Because they're, they're so intertwined. Now, we had error being taught in that period. And the way that we could discern that it was error was because it rejected old light. Right? Because all new light is an unfolding of established truths. And, and so when we saw Parminder or other people rejecting uh, things that were established, then we would know that they were teaching error. So if we're going to say that only what's established now is Habakkuk's two tables, I still can go back to Habakkuk's two tables and reconstruct our entire understanding of things that we have today. Because they're all there in Habakkuk's two tables. What followed from Habakkuk's two tables was the natural progression of that foundation. So you, you actually, if you want to undo July 18th and everything connected to it, you actually have to undo Habakkuk's two tables. You have to say that the basic premise was wrong was the repeat of Millerite history. Agreed. You can't just go back to 2012 because once we believe in the repeat of Millerite history, and that's well established, and you establish September 11th and the 2520 and those truths from Millerite history, Ezra 7 9 is just studying that history. You know, the chiasms that happened in 457 BC, the chiasms that happen in Samuel Snow's letters, all of those are just an extension of understanding Habakkuk's two tables. So it logically follows. And the movement was led in that direction. And we don't have any example in Millerite history of what Jeff is talking of. So if you if you say you believe that we're paralleling Millerite history, then you have to be consistent and look for the parallels in Millerite history. And, re and, and the parallel in Millerite history that we see is Miller after October 22, 1844, rejecting the Sabbath, rejecting the, the truths of the sanctuary. And, and so that's all we see. So uh, I, don't, I don't know how we could go back. As much as I love Jeff and I would be happy, you know, to for Jeff to take over the movement and and be the leader again. But it'd have to be based upon the things that God has revealed. It, it can't be a rejection of truth. On that basis, I can't follow Jeff as a leader. But but you can see the problem. Oh, man, I I feel the same way. And I, the last two days, I felt such heartache about this, even though I don't know nearly as much as you you do. 
I just feel in my spirit, you know, uh, I think it was April 21st of last year, I had this dream and there was a dark haired elf. And now I figure that was Jeff, although I didn't recognize him in the dream. And he, and I was in the sanctuary is at the back and I was viewing this and this elder was telling, telling the congregation to change the sign. We are no longer seventh day Adventists. We are now first day Sunday keeping Adventists. And then I woke up and I thought, well, oh, that is exactly what's going on. I had no idea it was happening with Jeff. Okay. Yeah, and because that's really what it's going back to, if you're going to look at, at the parallel. But it's, I mean, obviously it's very unpleasant. You know, this is not, and, and, and the thing is, you know, as I, as I said before, we had people in the past saying, well, Jeff, you know, Jeff is dead or Jeff has fulfilled his role. And, but yet there was no basis for saying that at that point. I mean, if you're going to look at Parminder's movement, uh, that's the Waterton tent, right? That's, that's where you would have to place it. The fanaticism. Yeah, it's the fanaticism of, of the Waterton uh, camp at, you know, at Exeter. Um. And, and and God has given us this, you know, that it, it would just be impossible to do. I mean, I don't know how you could even do it, how you could say, well, you know, all of this stuff that we've studied, we have to set it aside. And where do you go from there? It, it, there would be no direction. All it would be is, a, you know, a stultifying ossification. I mean, you couldn't move forward because all of the light that we had from the past, from the foundation that was laid, any of those directions that we want to go, they would be cut off. They would say, no, that leads to fanaticism. So we couldn't even go back to Millerite history and, and talk about Boston and Exeter and, and the dates that are there. You know, we couldn't add up, you know, the first day of the first month, 11, plus the fifth day of the fourth month, 54. First day of the fifth month, 15, plus the 10th day of the seventh month, 107, and get them to add to 187. But if we did that, that would be fanaticism. We can't, we can't have that symbol of 187 from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. Because that would be fanaticism. Almost anything that we would try to do in examining Millerite history would be fanaticism, according to what, what Jeff is presenting in this article. And of course, the whole argument doesn't make any sense. I mean, the whole basis of this, this, this narrative, on the surface, somebody just reading it superficially, it might make sense. But based on what we know, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't represent reality. So... Now, so the only other thing, you know, that we can say about this here is we don't know what's going to happen in the movement. But I, I think, you know, Pat Rampey's decision to just follow Jeff is going to be the most common theme. Well, I posted about Gospel Workers 297 on and I, I believe the Lord brought me to that path. I, 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 I really need to read what Dwight is sharing because I think they probably mesh. And it's just what we're going through now, you know, sound doctrine, warning against false teaching, the word of God, our safeguard, is, and it's under the subject dangers, renewal of the straight testimony, departing, Diverting minds, I can hardly see here, from present duty, a warning against false teaching. That's just the yeah. test of new life. You know, it's yeah. just, so, and we understand is, how to do that. Right? That's what we've been applying as we've been moving forward. Right? Oh, man. Like, why no. give up now? You know, it just, it doesn't make any sense at all. Why go back? I know if, if, if I go back, I'll perish. 
I mean, why would I renege on everything that I'm trying to build a foundation on and go forward with that? Well, basically, everything that I've done since 2012 and even before, I mean, has always been about um, understanding the past, right? So understanding the prophecies of the 2300 days, the 70 weeks, the 2520, uh, and that establishing upon a solid basis of reality, that is, the dates that actually exist in history. You know, the week of Christ study is based upon what are the actual dates? When was Jesus actually crucified? When was Stephen stoned? And, and, and from those studies comes all of this light that is, supports what we already understand to be truth, supports Adventism, supports Millerite history. None of it, you know, brings in any new uh, doctrine or teaching that contradicts uh, what is plainly stated in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So to call that error, I, I have a very difficult time with. Now, so Jeff uh, posted a new article today. So it, it wasn't there a couple hours ago, at least when I looked. Uh, but it's there now. So it's number five. Uh, has anyone looked at this yet? No. I've scanned it. Okay, so this is just going to be where he's going to take, you know, Elijah and Moses uh, standing on their feet, right? Because he dealt with them being slain, right? Um, so, so we're just going to go through this now, I guess, since we're here and it's here. Um, so um, the messenger represented as Elijah proclaiming the message represented by Moses is slain in the streets by a beast that ascends out of, from the bottomless pit. After being trampled down for a period represented by the curse of Moses, which is the scattering of Leviticus 26, the Holy Spirit enters into their dead bodies through God's word. They then stand up and thereafter ascend up into heaven. A message that is represented as in heaven is the everlasting gospel of the three angels. So I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So, of course, this is Millerite history. They're slain during the French Revolution. We understand this, right? Um, but before they ascend to heaven, they first stand upon their feet, right? After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them, which saw them, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Every prophet agrees with the other prophets, and they all come together in the book of Revelation. The book of Ezekiel teaches that when the Spirit enters into men, they stand upon their feet. Right? So we have this example in Ezekiel. Ezekiel represents God's people in the last days who are dead, yet they hear God speak. And the reception of God's word brings the presence of the Holy Spirit. And they then stand upon their feet. Those in Revelation who have been slain and left in the street to be trampled down for twenty, for 1260 day, symbolic days also hear God's word, which conveys the Holy Spirit into their hearts and minds, and they stand upon their feet. Ezekiel informs us that the word of God is that they hear, that forms us what the word of God is that they hear, which in turn brings the entire movement represented by Moses and Elijah that has been dead in the streets back to life and causes them to stand. So this is going to be Ezekiel 37. We're familiar with this, right? It's going to be the four winds. So that's what right. he's going to be representing, right? So Daniel and John represented God's 144,000 in the last days who have been symbolically killed and resurrected. John in the boiling oil, Daniel in the lion's den. The movement that was an offspring of its Laodicean mother is symbolically slain and thereafter resurrected thus becoming the eighth that is of the seven. It is the re resurrection of the sixth church, which was Philadelphia, that becomes the eighth. Now, so this is what he did in the previous art article. He dealt with the seven churches, says that Philadelphia is the church that is resurrected. Now, the model for that doesn't really make sense because when we're dealing with the churches themselves, these are periods of time which God gives specific messages to those periods of time. And we know that we're Laodicean. 
And if we don't recognize we're Laodicean and we believe we're Philadelphian, then we're Laodicean, right? Amen. Okay. Because because we're Laodicean, we need to recognize that. Because otherwise, the message to us is going to be rejected. Because if we don't recognize we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, then we're not going to heed the message to buy the gold that's tried in the fire. We're not going to take the white raiment. We're not going to be clothed with it. And we're not going to take the eye salve that we need. Right? We're going to think we're Philadelphians. And so if we're Philadelphians and we're not Laodiceans, then we prove that we are Laodiceans by believing we're Philadelphians. That's that's the danger there. So, so we know this application of this Holy Spirit coming in. This, this is God reviving his church, right, in the last days. It's 144,000. So this is a work that needs to be done. But we can't, you know, sort of force it into this structure of, of what happened in the French Revolution and then say, well, that refers to our movement, the messages of Moses and Elijah uh, being taken over by the beast from the bottomless pit in 2012. There's just, just no logic in it. Uh, that I can see because we need to understand the lines and those lines come from Millerite history. And so if we're using Millerite history, where do we see that? We don't see it in Millerite history at all in relationship to the movement going off course. Okay. So, um, so he's going to use this about understanding the books of Daniel and Revelation. We'll have an entirely different religious experience, which we all agree with. Um, the experience of the legal religion of Laodicea is changed by a life-giving message, right? That's the message to the Laodiceans. Correct? Yes. Right. Not the message to the Philadelphians. And and these things come in their order. So there's a message to the Philadelphians at that point of time in Millerite history. Because that movement is a wonderful manifestation of the power of God. But then they become Laodiceans. And now we're repeating that. We've repeated that through uh, uh, the four generations of Adventism. And then we have uh, Sardis. Philadelphia. So we could characterize Sardis from 1989 to November 9th, 2019. Right? At least. We could maybe put it to September 11th if we want to. But we know we bring that September 11th is two way marks. uh, The formalization of the message and uh, of the first message and the arrival of the second. So so whether we want to say that September 11th or November 9th, it doesn't really make much difference. They, they, they're the same way, Mark. So that's going to be the Church of Sardis. And then we have the Church of Philadelphia. And that's going to be this movement definitely from November 9th, 2019 to July 18, 2020. After July 18th, this movement becomes laid to sea again. We can't just go back to Philadelphia because that's not where we are in our minds. So we obviously can recognize um, uh, the idea of that's being talked about here. I don't think we need to go through this. um, In in all the detail, because we're very familiar with this, the met the, the council of the true witness to the Laodiceans, right? That's going to be the shaking. Right. So this, this we're familiar with. I was asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony 
called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear the straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause the shaking among God's people, the rising up against that message. Right. So when it says that the that shaking was caused by the straight testimony, Ellen White shows it's it's the rising up against the straight testimony that actually causes the shaking. So that means the message that needs to be born to this movement at this time is the message to the Laodiceans, not the message to the Philadelphians. And if we believe that we're Philadelphians, then we're not going to heed the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. That doesn't apply to us. That applies to them. That's always been the problem with Adventists, with conservative Adventists. The message of the Laodiceans doesn't belong to us. It doesn't apply to us, they say, because we're not Laodiceans. They are. We need to recognize, though, that we are Laodiceans. Only all who truly receive it and obey it will be purified. Right? So we have to receive it and obey it. We'll be purified. It doesn't make us not Laodiceans. It makes us Laodiceans. So, and, and the message to the Laodiceans creates this order in God's church that is not man's order. That is, is not, you know, like Tabo and Parminder, you know, wanted to have this this new organization that they could call people out of. Now, when this work is done, God takes the work into his own hands. People are connected to Christ individually. And because they're connected to Christ individually, they are going to work in a united harmony with their brethren. The very fact that we have all of these divisions and problems demonstrates that we're unconverted. Oh, Ellen White says, God will arouse his people. If other means fail, heresies will come in among them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. The Lord calls upon all who believe his word to awake out of sleep. Was Matthew 25, 1 to 13, on you know, the 10 virgins. Precious light has come appropriate for this time. It is Bible truth showing the perils that are right upon us, and they are. <laughs> the light should lead us to a diligent study of the scriptures and a most critical examination of the positions which we hold. And that's what we all need to be doing now. And, and I, I, I know I have to go forward or I die. And I have no desire to go back. And I don't care who's going to, I mean, I do care. I care deeply who will fall. Why, why follow a man who's now backsliding? You know, yeah. we can remove so, him for all he did before this. But after this, unless he repents, he's going to be lost too. I can't see how he's going to be saved. Because he's responsible for all our souls, you know, in a sense. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's much easier to follow a person somebody that we can see than to follow Christ's leading, especially when we feel all alone. Right? It's much easier to go with the crowd. Um, <clears throat> so we know that this, this church becomes ordered. And she said, then says, numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way, the careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly plead and agonize for it, did not obtain it. And they were left behind in darkness. And their places were immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks. Evil angels still pressed around them, but could have no power over them. I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. It had effect. Many had been bound. Some Wives by their husbands and some children by their parents. The honest 
who had been prevented from hearing the truth now eagerly laid hold upon it. All fear of their relatives was gone and the truth alone was exalted to them. They had been hungering and thirsting for truth. It was dearer and more precious than life. I asked what made this great change. An angel answered, it is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. So we know that um, if we're going to apply this, we know that the loud cry of the third angel comes after the Sunday law. That's one thing we know. But we also know that there is a message that goes before that, that then is going to, at the Sunday law, empower God's people. So, and I haven't read this article yet. So um, he's going to talk about the straight testimony here, a message of Moses and Elijah. So he's going to keep tying this back to uh, this. So he says they were slain in the street on July 18, 2020 by a beast from the bottomless pit. So that's, so he says the, mo the message of Moses and Elijah were slain then. Okay. We have now is that does that happen in Millerite history on October 22nd, 1844? Is the message of Moses and Elijah slain then? No. No. Okay. So now, so if he's saying this, I mean, he seems to talk about this disappointment of July 18, 2020 in his other articles, but he would have to call it a false disappointment. But if we're going to look at the slain of Moses and Elijah, we know that's going to be in Millerite history, something that happens before, you know, 1798. And then in 1798, they're going to be resurrected. And so we look at that history of the resurrection of Moses and Elijah. If we were to apply it to this movement, we would have to place that as a return to the old past that happened after 1989. Right. If, if we're going to parallel our history with Millerite history, we would place it there. Right. All right. But this is this is about our movement in general. Correct. OK, because it's a repeat of Millerite history. Now. Can we then have Moses and Elijah slain again in our history? Now, we could, in a sense, in a parallel, because we know we can zoom into a line and we can have a, a way mark. And when you zoom into that way mark, you can see the same line that you saw before. So we could. We could place that, you know, we could zoom in, for instance, to November 9th, 2019. And we could apply it in that way, right? But... We need November 9th, 2019 in order to apply it, right? Which Jeff isn't going to have as any way mark on our lines, right? He's not going to have July 18, 2020 as a way mark on our lines. So how does he take July 18, 2020? How does he place that in a repeat of Millerite history? I don't know, right? So you can see the self-contradictory aspect to what he's doing because if july 18 2020 is not a way mark if it's not a fulfillment of prophecy how can you place this here on this line you would have to take the lines that he has and the line that he has would place it after 1989 You know, he's going to try to place, you know, Moses and Elijah. This is the message of Moses and Elijah it is restored in our history. And then it's going to be slain after September 11th, 2001, right? Because we're going to get this message of Moses and Elijah, this revival of this message. But he's going to have it slain again. But if he's repeating Millerite history, he can't have it slain again, right? He doesn't have the tools to do what he's doing because he's rejected those tools. You, you can't have it both ways.
And so we can't we can't take the resurrection of Moses and Elijah and equate it with the outpouring of the latter rain at the last days. Because it's not that way in Millerite history. It's going to be what happens after 1798. If we were, if we're repeating Millerite history, we can have it after 1989. We're going to take what Jeff is saying. But he can't have it again. He has no, no means to repeat these lines in that way. Um, so then he's going to go on. He's going to say, we have shown that the four way marks that represent the history of the seven thunders are represented in every reform line. So he's talking about the first, second and third angels message and then the fourth. Correct. That would seem to be correct. Yes. So he's going to go back to that model, which which is the correct model. So he says, in connection with that is the fact that each reform line, that each reform line, each of the four, so he must mean um, that in each of the reform line, each of the four way marks represents the same prophetic theme. So that is, we can zoom into a way mark and we can see that it's, at least that's what I think he's saying, that we, we can see it has the same characteristics. With Moses, the theme, um, now, maybe what he's saying, each reform line. Okay, so he's just saying we can look at all these other reform lines and that they have the same idea, right? So we can parallel all these reform lines. With Moses, the theme at each of the four waymarks typifying the seven thunders was the covenant with the chosen people. With David, it was an ark of God. With Christ, it was death and resurrection. With the Millerites, it was the day for a year principle. With future for America, it is Islam. Islam on September 11th, 2001. It was again Islam on July 18, 2020, with the failed prediction. The first disappointment and the beginning of a tarrying time. The third way mark that produces a mighty army that stands up is the message of the four winds, which represents Islam, the angry horse of Bible prophecy. So you can see here in these two paragraphs, this is incoherent. Right? I mean, can we say that we can do that? I mean, we know that each each reform line addresses a particular period of darkness, correct? Correct. Okay. And so that reform line, such as the three decrees, the darkness is the captivity. The three decrees deal with coming out of that captivity, right? You know, connected with that captivity is the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem. So obviously those three way marks of the, the three decrees are going to address coming out of the captivity, the setting up, the, the laying of the foundation of the tabernacle, its completion, and also the restoration of the city. All those things are going to happen in that reform line. In our reform line, it's a little more complicated in that it's, it is uh, the final reform line. It contains lots of different themes. Now, I don't know if you could say that the main issue for our reform line is Islam. Any more than you could say the main theme for Millerite history is Islam. Is Islam a big issue in Millerite history? I don't see it as a big issue, but I see it as a point. Right. So it's it's part of Millerite, Millerite history, right? They have August 11th, 1840. September 11th, 2001 parallels August 11th, 1840. Islam is just as much a part of Millerite history as it is of our history. Right. We can say that, can't we? I think that's evident. Yeah, okay. Now, now if he says it was again Islam on July 18, 2020, with the failed prediction, the first disappointment in the beginning of a tarrying time. So what he's going to do is he's going to take July 18, 2020, and he's going to parallel it with, it appears, April 19th, 1844. Though, um, not sure how he sees the first disappointment in Millerite history, but 
you know, you might put it as March 21st, 1844 now. I don't know. But the first disappointment of Millerite history and beginning of the Tarian time. So if he's going to put July 18, 2020 as a failed prediction that he would have to be par paralleling it with Miller's prediction, right? Correct. Was Miller's prediction false? Was it based upon a departure from truth in any way? His ultimate prediction? No, he, well, his his ultimate prediction is 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 just the end of the Jewish year, eighteen forty three. So the first disappointment is Miller's first disappointment based upon a departure from truth. I don't believe so. No, we, we've never taught such a thing. We've taught that that was led by God. So if you're going to parallel it with July 18, 2020, you would have to accept July 18, 2020 as being led by God. If you're going to make it the first disappointment. Now, of course, we know that in Millerite history, it's much more complicated about what their first disappointment is. We, we have we call it the first disappointment. Because that's the end of Miller's predictions. But they had many other disappointments. Right? They had the end of, of 1843. They had the fall of 1843. They had the spring of 1843. They had the beginning of 1843. You know, January 1st, 1843. They had kept expecting... That Christ was going to come at different points along the line. You could even call August 11th, 1840, uh, a disappointment in that they believed that the door of mercy was going to be shut in connection with that. And they expected it to happen much sooner. They believed that the seventh trumpet had begun to sound on August 11th, 1840, or shortly thereafter. Uh, many of the things that they predicted that were going to happen did not occur as they predicted them, yet they continued on. So if you're going to argue that they were an error, the only type of error that they had is the same type of error we have had. That is, we have not fully understood how God has led us. So if you accept July 18 as a failed prediction, you must accept the arguments that led to July 18, 2020. You can't call Miller a false prophet and Advent and Millerite history, Millerism, as false because they had failed predictions. Right? Correct. They had to continue to see that God had led them even in their disappointments. So the third way mark that produces a mighty army that stands up is the message of the four winds, which represents Islam, the angry horse of Bible prophecy. Now we do know that Islam has a part to play in our history. And I haven't read this article and I don't know exactly which direction God is, uh, Jeff is going, but you know, God is directing, has been directing this movement, and we know that he is directing us back to a study and understanding of Islam, however that's going to be. So, so we know the four winds has things to do with Islam. We know that Islam is still a part of prophecy. We know that we were wrong about what we predicted to occur on July 18, 2020. But I believe that that event was delayed because of our spiritual condition. So, so that's where he's going to end. It's quite a short article. Um, but that's, it, 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 you see the problems though with this type of argument. So, 
either July 18, 2020 is an actual way mark. And if it's a way mark, it becomes a way mark because God was leading the movement. But if you're going to remove it as a way mark, because God wasn't leading the movement, um, like, like if you're saying God wasn't the leading movement, you, you'd have to remove it as a way mark. You, you couldn't put it there as a way mark. But he's saying it's the first disappointment in the beginning of the tearing time. And yet everything that led to it was false. We, again, we have no example in Millerite history of that. Now, I have seen people do that with Millerite history. That is, uh, modern Adventist scholarship, do they accept August 11th, 1844 as a true prophecy? No. No. It's satanic, it's Satan's counterfeit prophecy, right? So they'll say, well, God was leading the Millerites even though they were being led by Satan. Right? Even though they made mistakes. You know, Desmond Ford says, you know, Billy Miller, as he calls him, um, I think it's Billy or Lily or something like that. You know, he, he was totally wrong about October 22nd, 1844. Totally wrong about the 2300 days. And that's fine with them, right? You know, but God still, God still was working in spite of the fact that these people were false prophets. And that's kind of the position Jeff would have to take. So, you know, so obviously he hasn't said everything on the subject, but you can see if you're going to say the Tatarian time uh, began after a disappointment and that, that July 18, 2020 uh, parallels that first disappointment, not October 22, 1844, the sec second disappointment, it just parallels the first. Um, he says, well, we're in a tearing time now. So what we're going to do, this would to be to me how I would take this thinking, is that we're now in the time of the second angel's message arrived, July 18, 2020. And so some new light is going to have to come to this movement. Uh, that's going to carry us on to the Sunday. Can, can we see the inconsistency here? I think it's pretty self-evident. Yeah, it's very self-evident. Now, the thing that 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 I've been pressing through all this history since July 18th and even before, and the thing that's troubled me the most is uh, the reality that we're very unchristlike. And this is not me judging other people and saying other people are unchristlike. This is talking about us, which includes me. Right? We don't represent Christ. We're not prepared for the things that are coming up upon the world and we know that God has given us this light to bring conviction and power to our lives when we look at ourselves we know we don't represent God as we should we know our lives are powerless and that we need a daily and moment by moment dependence upon Christ that there is no one that we can look to in this world, a person who's going to, that we can re just rely on so that we don't have to labor. We have to labor. We have to labor with the battle itself. We have to labor to study God's word. And uh, no man is our enemy. Right? We want, this is Joan's clear message in, uh, the studies we've been doing on Friday night. We wrestle against principalities and powers and 
uh, wickedness, really, which is in heavenly places, in high places. This isn't about man. This is a battle between Christ and Satan. And in that battle, uh, we are part of that battle. The battle that we face is the battle with self. And so much of what I see in this article, this is just me maybe being harsh on Jeff, but it's a way of deflecting responsibility. And, and it's, it's hidden in a guise of humility. That is, in the, in the previous article where it talks about it was pride that caused them to name the school the school of the prophets. I didn't see pride in Jeff. I don't think pride was the reason he named it the school of the prophets. I think he named it for the school of prophets because of what he wanted it to accomplish. Right? Jeff wasn't, Jeff wasn't exalting self when he did that. He wasn't saying, look at me, you know. But here in this situation, it, we can't use, um, you know, the argument that other people brought in error. This is, this is something out. The reason why we were disappointed was because of our own failure. Not the failure to understand prophecy, but the failure to have it do its do its work upon our hearts. And in the midst of all of those things that happened with, you know, the Omega and, and even before, the way in which error was dealt with was wrong. That we, in a sense, took the work into our hands to decide how to protect people from what we perceived as being error but we were doing worse than the church had done to us we misrepresented others people's positions in order to not address the points that were being put before us it's easier to shut someone out than to have a discussion with them where it might be shown that you're an error. And if you just shut them out, then you never have to address with anything wrong in your thinking. It's an easy way to do things, but it's not a Christ-like way. Because one is you're supposed to be ministering to those people that are in error. Now, sure, there comes a point where somebody's so in error and so opposed to the truth that you shake the dust off your feet. But this was not the case. I mean, I know I was dealt with in a way that was disproportionate to anything that was going on in my mind. And no, no idea, no way of, in which I was, the things I was accused of that I any any way connected with any of those ideas. I would know what I think, right? So when somebody tells me what I'm thinking, what I'm planning, they're not going to be able to convince me that I'm thinking and planning something that I know I'm not thinking and planning. And so we have to be careful of how we misrepresent others. Even here in this article, in dealing with Jeff's article, I don't know what Jeff's thinking. I don't know ultimately all of his arguments. I can look at the arguments themselves, though, and say these arguments are bad. But it's not saying anything about Jeff as a person. Anything about his character? You know, maybe in some ways I can say, well, he's not accepting responsibility. So maybe I'm saying something about his character in a little, in a, in a way. So, so I, maybe I can't say that completely. But I don't really know, right? I don't really know what's going on in somebody's heart. But I do know that the arguments that are being presented are not good arguments. That, that, that they can't follow from the premise that we've, we've had this attack upon this movement since 2012 from the Beast of the Bottomless Pit. And I definitely can't accept the idea that on September 11th, 2000, or not September, July 18, 2020, 
that that was produced by false prophecy. And yet it's also a waymark that marks the first disappointment. Because you would have to be saying it was false prophecy that led to April 19th, 1844, being the first disappointment. So, yeah, in, in a sense, it's self-evident. But sometimes we don't see the things that are self-evident right in front of us until we take time to look at them. Okay, so um, any more comments on this, this article and what's happening? A verse that just came to me is uh, James 1, 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I think that Jeff is just worn out. He's been listening to his family. He's been listening to doubters. And this is what he's coming out with now. Yeah, I would think, I would think as much as just from what I know about Jeff, is that definitely he has listened to the voices around him that he's trusted, which have proved to be untrustworthy. And he's not willing to see them as untrustworthy. He might be able to see himself as untrustworthy. Uh, in some, to some respect, he has at times, but he has a hard time not trusting those people around him that he loves. And the influence that Miller had upon him is parallel to the influence that Jeff has upon him at the present time. That, that that's pretty evident that that's the parallel from Millerite history. And would Miller argue that October 22, 1844, was based upon a false understanding of prophecy? Is that what Miller saw after October 22, 1844? I don't know. So. He didn't he didn't accept October 22, 1844 after after a while after the passing of the time as a valid date, right? He felt that that date was wrong. And and Jeff appears to be doing the same thing. Though he's giving it in, in his parallel of Millerite history, he's giving it the place of April 19th, 1844, not October 22, 1844. But if we're going to look at it, we would say when Miller reject, rejected, because he does reject October 22, 1844 as being a valid uh, prediction, right? He's going to eventually reject that. He'll say that that was just basically wrong. And that's what Jeff is saying about July 18th, saying it was wrong. And, and you can see to some degree, um, because of Samuel Snow and the direction that Samuel Snow went, and, and many of these other groups after October 22, 1844, and the reports that would come back to Miller, uh, he would just see a lot of fanaticism, right? And he would group uh, James and Ellen White in that. It would be hard for him to distinguish between James and Ellen White and Samuel Snow and um, Sister Minor and um, some of these other groups that were continuing to set dates and times and had different views on the shut door. Right. So for Miller, he's going to see October 22, 1844, just produced a bunch of fanaticism. It was a wrong prediction. I only came to accept it just at the last minute. And I'm now going to basically say, even though it was a wonderful experience, uh, which seems kind of contradictory, it wasn't of God. Right. So. And kind of that's what Jeff is saying. He's saying, you know, it was false prophecy that produced that date. 
we're going to parallel it. Now he's going to parallel it with the first disappointment, which makes no sense. But he just has these reports about what's going on. And so in his mind, all it is is a bunch of fanaticism. Right? So we don't know everything that's going on in Jeff's mind. But definitely he's rejecting uh, the model that produces July 18, 2020. But he's accepting July 18, 2020 as the first disappointment, according to this article. <clears throat> okay, so any other comments? Now, has anybody um, has has anybody seen how other people are reacting to Jeff's articles? Let's say people in the Canadian group or the American group or in Arkansas or anything like that. Does anybody know how other people are looking at these articles? Are we the only ones talking about? No. I really don't know. Okay. Stephen, have you talked to anybody about these articles? I uh, haven't, no. Okay. Yeah, I know, I know Dwight's not here now. I'm not sure where he went, but um, uh, whether he's talked to anybody, I know he's tried to make efforts to talk to uh, people in Arkansas. Um, I don't know if the Canadian and the American groups, has anybody watched or followed any of their presentations if they're talking about the articles? I mean, I don't know how you could um, not address this if you're in this movement in the studies that are going to be happening this Sabbath. So, I mean, I'm kind of curious what's going to be said about them or what people are thinking about them. Uh, so all I have so far is I have Pat Rampey's uh, response to the articles and uh, Bonnie's response to the articles. So, but not not this these last two. I don't know what, what Bonnie thinks about these. But the ones that, we, that Jeff did on Daniel chapter two, um, you know, she shared it with me on uh, Facebook Messenger, and I made a comment. She hasn't commented about it, but it just seems that from her post or her message is that this is a good thing that Jeff is presenting uh, these studies. So I guess we're going to have to wait and see how, how things unfold within this movement. Now, a good thing that could happen from this, so I tend to look at things from a positive light. It's not necessarily a very positive, positive light. It's kind of a negative, positive light. But if people are going to be going back to Jeff, that is going to change the dynamics within the movement that's moving forward. And maybe it can help bring about some unity, some reevaluation on our part uh, of our message. I don't, I don't necessarily know exactly how that could happen. But if our ranks become smaller, you know, let's say if the American group completely goes back to Jeff, which is what I expect, you know, that's me being pessimistic, I guess. But just so many of those people have followed Jeff in the past, it's likely that many of them will readily go back to Jeff. So whether that will cause infighting within our ranks, people discussing these things or not, I don't know. Uh, so I'm just looking at, you know, Pat Rampey. He's obviously going to be on the side of Jeff. That's what he's decided. You know, he just says, suit yourself, do whatever you want. But I'm going to, I'm going to uh, agree with Jeff. 
so, um, and I think that's going to be a common theme. It, it's human nature. It's the easiest thing to do. But that can be good for the movement. In that it, not, not in a nice way. It's not a fun way to get things addressed. But there would be people who really have not been supportive of July 18, 2020 in the movement who may decide, yes, this was wrong. Finally, Jeff is speaking out. Um, I'm going to join Jeff. I'm not going to be participating with those false prophets who still believe in July 18, 2020. And that would bring that take, remove that influence that I believe has been um, a subversive uh, influence within the movement. So, so that would be a possibility, but I don't know. I don't know how everyone's going to react to it. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to single out Eldon here. So Eldon, you there? Uh, yes, I am here. So, I mean, I know you're usually, you don't know, talk a lot in these studies, but what do you see in, in, in what's happening with these articles or in your experience of what's happening from your perspective of the movement? I know I'm putting you on the spot. You don't have to answer yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just quickly say that I haven't read and, um, really gone over these articles as of yet so i'm you know still um coming at it from whatever we've discussed yeah. in our studies here so i don't know if i've uh, drawn a conclusion yet but mm -hmm. um i i'm not in my mind i'm not tending to um want to reject you know what has happened in the last number of years um going back to 2012 is really before I entered this movement but um you know I've tried to learn what had happened um mm -hmm. between that time and um you know when I came in somewhere around 2016 yeah okay yeah so people need to read these articles for themselves now there's a lot of articles there uh, on on uh, the Future for America uh, website. And um, these ones, though, dealing with July 18, 2020, the first three don't really, um, I mean, they might be hinting at, at the idea that there's something wrong with July 18, 2020. Uh, but it's not until number four that we really get his his expression where um, he's going to just basically come out full guns blazing against um, the July 18, 2020 prediction, right? So that's where he's going to, um, just looking at it here, uh, he talks about, the school of the false prophets. <clears throat> so he says that um, the warfare began when Future for America determined to stop the work it had been doing since 1996 and begin a school, which in its pride it called the school of the prophets. Better would it have been to call the school the school of the false prophets. And, and his argument is the chaos and confusion that ensued when the school began began allowing those who had never been confirmed by the Lord as his messengers to introduce their own ideas, ended with the death of Future for America on July 18, 2020. Um, at that point, Moses and Elijah had been slain in the streets. So so there's some things that he says that I'm not sure of, of how to take them. So he says, in 2013, that's when they're going to start the School of the Prophets, it's going to be after Habakkuk's two tables. Then uh, chaos and confusion ensues. Well, 
I, I don't see the chaos and confusion. I mean, you could say that definitely a lot of stuff happened. I mean, all kinds of information came to this movement. But he's saying it was allowing those who had never been confirmed by the Lord as his messengers. Now, I'm not really sure how you decide. Um, first is allowing. I mean, allowing people to present things. In Millerite history, they definitely allowed people to present light. Uh, there was not any kind of shutting shutting down people because uh, uh, they were in error. Things were examined. They spent time examining things. But he's saying that there was allowing. So somebody allowed people who had never been confirmed by the Lord. How do you know somebody's confirmed by the Lord? It would be based upon his message. And, and definitely there were people confirmed by the school of the prophets, Parminder, Tabo, um, the other guy, I can't think of his name, um, and, and others, you know, but there we had, you know, three elders ordained. So were they not confirmed by the Lord? I mean, if they weren't confirmed by the Lord, why did Jeff ordain them? And so I'm not even sure what confirmed by the Lord means as his messengers. So I would think, you know, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So that's how you would determine it, not based upon what man has said. But that's so that's something for us to understand, to study. So uh, so this is the end of the study here today. I know on Sunday I'd like to get back to uh, studying uh, Daniel's last vision. But this this does apply. Right. It's it, it's part of the basis of understanding of where we are and how we understand Daniel chapter 11. Now, I'm not sure where Jeff puts Daniel chapter 11 then in this context, because he's now going to focus upon Islam, which he used to say that uh, the 2520 was a distraction from Daniel chapter 11. Back when he did Habakkuk's two tables, he makes that statement. Um. And I think that's in October of uh, 2012, where he makes that statement about it being a distraction. And uh, he didn't say it was error, it just says it was distracting us from our main message. So um, so anyway, uh, let's uh, close in prayer. We'll come back to this on Sunday. So, and thanks, Elvin, for your comments. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we come again before you. We know, Lord, that uh, we want to understand your word and we're willing to be corrected of any error that we have in our thinking. And we pray for Jeff and for his family and for this movement. Uh, we do want, not want to see any soul lost. And we ask, Lord, that you can help us to reveal your character and to minister to those around us. The first, Lord, we know that we need to be converted and that um, we have made many mistakes in how we have dealt with others in, in, in not representing you in various different ways, either by not supporting the truth with our words and actions and sitting on the fence or at times um, attacking individuals that we disagreed with. So, Lord, we just pray that you can help us as we seek to follow you. Thank you for hearing our prayer, for the studies that we have. Be with us tomorrow evening and Sabbath morning in our studies as well. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>